Good morning. My name is Michael Bryant, and I serve as the VP for Strategic Planning, Faith Integration, and Christian Leadership at Charleston Southern University. I want to talk to you this morning about how to make good decisions, how to make good decisions. This uh, presentation is for the Leadership Institute. Uh, the Leadership Institute provides leadership development training, especially for students. And so I've shared this presentation before with students here at CSU. And I, I think it's good uh, because it's important for leaders to think about making decisions. Whether or not you realize it, you, um, if you want to be a leader, students, if you want to be a leader, it's important that you think about how to make good decisions. Part of being a leader is making decisions again and again and again. You will make decisions about spending money, uh, how to lead your team, what direction they should take. You'll make decisions about who to hire and where to place them. And then you also uh, have to make decisions about settling disputes. And so what maybe you haven't thought about it before, but an important uh, part of being a leader is learning how to make good decisions. And so I want to talk to you this morning about how to make good decisions. In fact, I'm going to share with you seven principles for making good decisions. Now, we'll go through each of these in more detail in just a moment. But let's walk through these seven principles. First, maintain a growing relationship with Christ. Number two, follow the Bible. Number three, get more information. Number four, get wisdom from godly people. Number five, evaluate the options. Number six, consider the decision in light of other goals. And number seven, engage in personal reflection. So these are all principles that we're going to look at this morning, uh, some in more detail than others, but uh, I think they're very, very helpful when it comes to making good decisions. And so the first principle that we want to talk about this morning is maintaining a growing relationship with Christ. So you want to make uh, good decisions. How do you do that? I think first and foremost, um, as a believer, as a Christian leader, you strive to maintain a growing relationship with Christ. At the foundation of all good decisions for believers is one's personal relationship with Christ and a growing, vibrant relationship with Christ. Now, what do I mean when I talk about maintaining a growing relationship with Christ? Uh, I'm talking about uh, those who truly know him, those who have a personal relationship with him. Uh, you've placed your faith in him, your trust in him. You spend time with him uh, in your word, in his word. Um, you spend time with other believers in a worship setting, like in a local church or a local fellowship. Uh, you interact with other Christians on a local, on a regular basis so that they can correct you. You can have iron sharpening iron. Now, why is it so important uh, to maintain a growing relationship with Christ if you want to make good decisions? Well, I would say that uh, growing uh, uh, in Christ, maintaining this growing relationship is important because it helps you to know how the Lord thinks. And as you come to know how Christ thinks about various things, you will come to know and understand how he thinks about the decisions that you have to make. Um, by spending time with him uh, and with other believers and also in worship, you will understand how to make good decisions. So recently, I just celebrated my 24th wedding anniversary. So I've been married to my, my wife for more than uh, two decades, almost uh, two and a half decades. Uh, that's a long time. And uh, one thing that I've learned is that when you live with someone for that many years, they come to know how you think. They know your opinion. Uh, so if you were to ask my wife, you know, who did he vote for? Uh, how does he like his food cooked? Uh, what does he enjoy doing? What kind of hobbies does he have? She could tell you those things and more. In fact, I joke sometimes because uh, people will uh, ask me a question uh, and, and uh, I'll respond. And I realize that if they, if they ask my wife, how would he have responded to that question? She could probably tell you how I would respond to a given question. And it's true for married couples. It's true for friends who've known each other a long time. When you maintain a relationship with someone and it's a growing relationship, you come to understand how they think about things. And, and you would probably have a pretty good idea of how they would respond if a given question uh, came up. Now, how do we apply this principle maintain a growing relationship with Christ uh, to maybe a, a situation where a leader has to make a decision or a, a Christian leader has to make some kind of decision. Well, um, say that you have been 
hurt, say that you have hurt a friend, you have made an offhanded comment that uh, hurt your friend's feelings, and um, you know they're, they're not speaking to you, they've distanced themselves from you, and uh, you notice that, and so you have a choice. Uh, basically, you can ignore the problem, you could ignore the, the rift in the relationship, in the broken relationship, or you can go to your friend and you can be reconciled. Now, as I think about this principle of maintaining a growing relationship with Christ, um, if you or I have uh, a close relationship with the Lord and we're constantly interacting with him, we're going to know how he thinks about this situation. And so if I had a relationship with someone and maybe I said something I shouldn't, I was too harsh in what I said, uh, and I hurt their feelings and they were distanced from me, uh, one of the first scriptures that would come to mind would be Matthew 5, 9 where uh, Jesus is speaking, and he says, blessed are the peacemakers. So I know the way the Lord Jesus thinks. He values peace. He values peacemakers. He values peace in relationships. Um, I also think of another passage in uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Jesus is speaking, and uh, the context is, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, and he's speaking about someone who is engaged in worship, someone who was worshiping the Lord, and listen to what he says. Verse 23, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled, and then come and offer your gift. So as I think about these, these passages, they tell me how the Lord thinks. They tell me how Jesus thinks about relationships that are <clears throat> not peaceful, uh, relationships where people need to be reconciled. Um, I know because Jesus values peace, he values reconciliation. What I need to do if I'm going to be a Christian leader and lead myself and repair this relationship, I'm going to have to take the initiative, go to my friend and um, apologize or um, let them know I didn't mean to hurt their feelings uh, and I want to be reconciled. And so uh, the principle, number one then, is maintain a growing relationship with Christ. Maintain a growing relationship with Christ. As you spend time with the Lord, you will understand how he thinks about things, and uh, you, will, you will come to respond uh, as he would want you to. The second principle I want to talk to you about is follow the Bible. Now, this is very close to the second one, and, but I'm sort of just spending a little bit more time reflecting on the scriptures. Um, you know, the scriptures are central in maintaining a growing relationship with Christ, and that's why I want to to spend a little bit more time on this. But when we talk about following the Bible, um, anytime that you as a Christian leader are faced with a decision, you should ask yourself this question. What does the Bible teach in this situation? What does the Bible say in this situation? Does the scripture directly or is there a principle that I can take from the scriptures indirectly that I might apply to this decision? Now, in reality, um, that doesn't always work because um, maybe you're dealing with something the Bible doesn't address it directly, but you would be surprised how often uh, the Bible provides a principle or speaks indirectly uh, to the decision that you were trying to make. And so the first question that you always want to ask when you're trying to make a decision is, what does the Bible say? And if the Bible answers it directly, indirectly, gives you a principle, you'll want to apply the scriptures. I want to look at a few examples um, where we have a problem that we're facing, have a decision that we're facing, and we apply the scriptures. Um, imagine that you drove your parents' car to the beach, and uh, in taking their car to the beach, you know, when you were leaving, you got into their car, and as you were, you were leaving the parking lot, you scratched a, a car that, is, uh, that was unmanned or uh, didn't have the driver in it. So you scratched your parents' car, you scratched a parked car, and uh, you don't know where the driver is to the parked car because they're not around. And, and so you basically have several decisions that you have to make uh, in regard to the damage. And uh, do you, first of all, call your parents and tell them what they did, what you did, that you scratched their car and scratched someone else's car and you don't know who it is. Do you tell the person whose car you scratched uh, that you damaged their car? Maybe you might leave a note um, and leave your cell number or something or an email. Uh, now, in my mind, as I think about this, uh, this is a matter of personal integrity. 
uh, of honesty. I mean, you and I certainly wouldn't like it if someone scratched our car and didn't tell us and didn't, you know, didn't even show the courtesy to tell us. And we certainly wouldn't like it if our children did it, if, if we had children. Uh, so think about how your parents would feel. But the verse that comes to my mind is Matthew 537. Jesus says this, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. What does this passage mean? It means that Christians are to be people of integrity. People are, Christians are to be people of integrity. Now, the gospel of Matthew, Matthew 537, doesn't address cars, doesn't address, you know, scratched cars or parked cars at the beach. So, it, you know, it doesn't, doesn't give you like a, like a, you know, it's not apples to apples necessarily, but I think the principle that you take from this passage can be applied in many, many different situations. And believers are to be people of integrity. Believers are to be people who tell the truth. Um, and so I think that your decision in this situation, if you're going to lead yourself in a way that honors the Lord, uh, is to first call your parents, tell them what you've done, maybe write a note with your cell phone uh, number or uh, your email on the parked car and say, hey, it's just a small scratch, but um, you know, I want to make things right if, if I need to. And so I, I think that would be, this would be an example where the scriptures inform um, indirectly uh, the decision that you have to make. Um, another example would be uh, a relationship example, and this is a bit more complex, but I think the Bible applies nevertheless. So ladies, um, imagine that your boyfriend has been pressuring you to have sex. Uh, at first, he dropped subtle hints, and, and now he's just, you know, constantly bringing it up again and again and again. I mean, he says he's a believer, you're a believer, you want to honor the Lord in this relationship, but right now, uh, this relationship isn't going in the right direction. And so, uh, if, if you want to frame this situation uh, in a very just general way, you are in a relationship with someone, and they are uh, encouraging you or pressuring you uh, to dishonor the Lord, to disobey God. And so, what do you do in this situation? How do you make a decision? Uh, do you do you end a relationship uh, that encourages you to disobey Christ? Uh, do you you know do you just remain passive and hope it goes away? Do you do you say something again? Now, you've already said something one time, but it hasn't done any good. Uh, what do you do? I mean, how do you how do you decide uh, in this situation? Well, um, I I framed this situation already for you. You might frame it a different way, but the way I would see this is uh, just generally you are in a relationship with someone and they are encouraging you to disobey Christ, to dishonor him, to go against his word. Um, so what might be some passages that we can apply for this specific situation? Well, I wanna look at two passages here. The first would be Genesis 39, uh, 11 and 12. In Genesis chapter 39, verses 11, 12, the context uh, is uh, Egypt uh, and so, this story tells us about how uh, Joseph, who was sold as a slave into Egypt, um, he, was, um, he was in the house of uh, Potiphar, and uh, Potiphar was his boss. And uh, when Potiphar was away, Potiphar's wife took a liking to Joseph. She, had, she uh, propositioned him not once, but multiple times. And so Joseph had a decision to make. Um, his master wasn't around. Um, Supposedly, you know, no one, no one would ever know. All of it's never true, but he's he's tempted to commit adultery here. And uh, listen to what is recorded in Genesis 39, 11 and twelve. Now, one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the household servants were there, she grabbed him by his garment and said, "Sleep with me." But leaving his garment in her hand, he escaped and ran outside. And so Joseph has already made a decision. He has ran away. Um, he has fled temptation, uh, and I think from his example, uh, we find several principles that we can apply. One would be flee se sexual temptation. So he deals with it very drastically. Um, he, he flees sexual temptation. I think another principle that we might glean from this would be don't have intimate relations with someone else's spouse. Okay, and so from the scriptures, uh, we find principles that we can apply to the type of relationship that I described earlier. Um, I think if someone is pressuring you to disobey Christ, to go against his word, you know, especially as something as serious as um, sexual sin or just personal integrity, um, that would be a relationship that you would want to flee or certainly distance yourself from.
from. Another passage of scripture that we can look at would be 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Uh, 1 Thessalonians was written by the Apostle Paul um, about six months after he planted the church at Thessalonica. And he was, he was writing to believers about sexual purity. Now, the people that Paul wrote to uh, lived uh, in a culture uh, that, that um, didn't necessarily see anything wrong with having intimate relations outside of marriage. Um, it, was, it was expected. It was, it was, you know, for some normal. And yet Paul was going to make very clear that uh, sex outside of marriage is not God's will. Listen to what he says here. For this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality. There's so much in here, uh, but let me just make a few comments. Paul says, this is the will of God, okay? Not that you have to search for it, not that you have to look through the heavens, not that you have to spend time, you know, six months in prayer, seeking God's will. It is God's will that you grow in holiness. <clears throat> and part of growing in holiness is to flee, is to stay away from sexual immorality, what is sexual immorality? As Paul and other scriptures define sexual immorality, it is any sexual relationship outside of the, the context of marriage. Uh, so whether that's adultery, whether that's premarital sex, the only appropriate um, sex for believers would be within the context of marriage. And so what is the, what is the principle that we glean from this? It's God's will that you be holy and holiness includes not having sex outside of marriage. With someone other than your spouse. Uh, so I think from, you know, these two passages of scripture, there are enough principles, and there are principles that are repeated enough times to give this young lady that we talked about in this scenario a pretty good understanding of what she should do. Uh, if she wants to make a good decision, uh, then she needs to follow what, what the Word of God says. And I'm not saying this always easy to do, I mean, especially when you're in relationships with people, maybe they're friends or they're, you know, you might be in a situation where it's, it's a longtime friend or a family member or somebody you really want to impress. It's not always so easy just to follow scripture, but it is always better. Uh, you will always come to a better decision, the best decision when you follow scripture, rather than putting the will of people or your emotions uh, ahead of the scriptures. So we have mentioned two principles so far. One is maintain a growing relationship with Christ, and the other is follow the Bible. But there's a third principle that I want to share with you that will help you make good decisions and help you be a good, good leader, I think, for yourself and also for others, and that is get more information. Get more information. Now, you're going to hear this, and you're going to say, that's so simple. I mean, everybody knows that, and it is simple. You're right. But you would be amazed at people when they are facing a decision, how they won't take the time to get more information. They will follow what they say is their intuition, or they will say, I know exactly what I want to do, and they'll just do it. And they want time to engage in addition to engage in additional research. So when we talk about getting information, getting more information, uh, why is that important? Uh, it is important important because, um, as a general rule, the more information that you have, the better decision that you can make. The more information that you or I have about something, uh, the better decision that we can make. Uh, now, uh, it helps us, I think, the, the, the additional information helps us to see the bigger picture. The additional information helps us to see things that are not necessarily on the surface. Um, getting more information helps us to appreciate better the pros and cons of the situation. And so I think it's important that you and I, when we're faced with a decision, that we get more information. Now, one example that I want to give, uh, share with you or walk you through would be buying a used car. Um, about a month ago, about a month and a half ago, um, my son's vehicle, um, you know, pretty much gave up the ghost. It had about 245,000 miles on it. And we said, you know, we've, we've probably got to get a new vehicle for my son. And so we began looking around the Charleston area, the Somerville area, for a used vehicle. Uh, and as we looked, we sought to get as much information as possible. And where did we get information from? We got information from people. So there, there are people who are a whole lot more informed than, than I am when it comes to uh, buying cars or uh, what you know, the quality of cars. And then we also sought to get more information from 
additional resources. And so when we talk about people um, who might provide us with information, I mean, this is just common sense. I mean, there are some people who just know a lot more about cars, um, a lot more about what to look for than you or I might. And so it's just logical that we go and speak with that person. We might know someone who knows an honest car salesman or who has had a really good experience with someone. And so I think just texting someone, calling someone, uh, finding, getting more information from someone uh, will save you a lot of heartache uh, later on. Um, another, another piece of information or source of information, of course, would be additional resources. And what I'm talking about here is uh, maybe a website, um, Maybe um, there are all kinds of resources on, on the web, like uh, cargurus.com, uh, jdpower.com. Uh, there are YouTube videos on how to buy a car, what questions to ask. And again, this, this just seems so simple, but uh, you would be amazed at people that just show up, uh, look at a car, don't do any investigation, don't talk to anybody, don't look at you know, any kind of report on the car, and they just buy it and then they're miserable later on. And so, you know, if you and I want to make a good decision, uh, we're sometimes going to have to consult other people. We're sometimes going to have to get information from additional resources. We're gonna to have to do some research and then we can, we can make um, a good decision. Um, if you say, if you're a person who tends to say, I know what I need to know, um, I know what I want to do, be careful because that's the mark of an arrogant person. Or if you're someone who says, you know, I don't have time. I mean, I would, I would respond and say, you know, if it's a major decision, if, especially a, if you're making a major purchase, $10,000, $20,000, uh, you know, take your time and, and think it through because if you want to make a wise decision, uh, you've got to do some additional research um, in order to make, a, to make a good decision. Well, we've talked about some principles um, already, uh, but let me share with you a fourth principle, and that would be get wisdom from godly people. Get wisdom from godly people. Okay, and so if you want to make a good decision, uh, what I would encourage you to do is to find someone who is older than you, who has walked with the Lord longer than you, um, who has you know, lived through various experiences, uh, and you can get godly wisdom from them. You may not realize this, but God has placed um, godly believers in your path, whether at church or, uh, you know, just in your life, and uh, God can use these people to help you make a very, very wise decision, but you've, you've got to be open to listening to other people, and you've got to be open to allowing people to speak into your life. Um, sometimes I think we as people, whether we're young or old, I just think it's human nature to um, maybe keep decisions to ourselves or to think we can take care of the decision by ourselves. But sometimes just a conversation with someone who is a little bit older, a little bit wiser, uh, who walks with the Lord especially, can help you make um, a wise, wise decision. And I'll, I'll just be very transparent with you this morning. Um, you know, I'm almost 50 years old, I'm 48 years old. Um, I have a PhD. I'm a VP at a Christian university. Um, I've walked with the Lord a long time. I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. Uh, but there are still people that I seek out, people who are older, who are much wiser than me, uh, godly Christians that I consult for information. Um, I have people that I try to learn from who are older than me, who are godly. And I have younger people who are um, you know, just, just starting out on life, and I try to pour into them and to give them godly wisdom. And so I think a good way to look at it is you learn when you have a decision to make, you learn from godly people who are older than you, but then as younger people come to you and they're having to make decisions maybe about marriage or about um, buying a house or finances or just dating or, you know, purchases or something, you can, you can share with them uh, godly wisdom. Now, what might this look like? I mean, practically speaking, what might it look like to get godly wisdom from someone? Well, it might mean sitting down with your parents uh, in your living room and discussing a decision that you are considering. You would say, Michael, my parents aren't Christians. And my parents aren't believers. That, that may be true for some of you who are listening, but some of you have 
um, maybe a godly mother or a godly father and I, or a godly uncle, and I would encourage you to speak with them and to, to sit down with them and to discuss the decision that you're facing. Um, it might also look like speaking with a teacher uh, there are plenty of teachers here at CSU, godly teachers that really want students to make wise decisions, good decisions. And so I would encourage you uh, as, you know, as you're a student and you're listening uh, to this presentation, um, you are not going to bother uh, a professor when you email them and ask them if you could maybe sit down uh, and have coffee uh, and, and maybe share your, your problem or the decision that you're trying to make. Uh, I think they would appreciate that. And I think they'll give you good counsel, the, the best counsel they can. It might also look like just sitting down with a godly leader in your church. Um, you know, you may, you may go to a church, to a fellowship, and if you will look around, if you will pay attention, God has placed in that fellowship believers who are older, who are wiser, who are godly, and they would love to sit down with you and maybe uh, talk on a Saturday morning um, and you know, get to know you and, and help you with the problem that you're facing um, if they're able. And so um, when facing a decision, uh, there are times where you and I need to get godly wisdom from other people who are older and wiser. Um, this is going to require uh, certain things of you and certain things of me. It's, it's going to require that we take a certain attitude about ourselves, a humble attitude, and uh, it's going to require us to say, you know what, I'm limited in my perspective. I, I don't know everything. It's going to require you and me to say, I need the godly wisdom of others. It's going to require us to learn from those who are older uh, and to recognize that, that we can learn from people who are older. I think sometimes young people have the idea that uh, older people, um, you know, maybe they don't understand your time or your times or your situation or your experiences. Uh, they may not have had technology, you know, 30 or 40 years ago like they do today. It may not be the exact same situation, but um, they have experienced similar situations and they have experienced similar challenges and they face similar questions. And I guarantee you they can help you in some way. So what else will this require of you? So I told you how it will, it will essentially require a humble attitude on your part it's also going to require that you take specific actions on your part. I think, first of all, if you're going to follow principle number four, uh, you're going to have to, first of all, take the initiative and build a relationship with someone else. Um, older people, or just anyone really, I mean, anyone outside of yourself, they may not think that you want a relationship with them. They may not think that you would even be interested in getting to know them. And so, if you're going to learn from others, especially if you're going to get godly wisdom from other believers who are older, you're going to have to take the initiative and form a relationship with them. Speak to them, spend time with them, uh, and then you're, you're going to have to take the time, okay? Not just a casual conversation, but um, spend time, uh, invest in them, and allow them to invest in you. Uh, this is the only way that you'll form those relationships uh, so that you can get that godly wisdom, wisdom to make a good decision, but then also um, later, or as God allows, pour into someone who was younger to you than you and to provide uh, godly wisdom. Um, I recognize this may be strange or awkward or uncomfortable, um, but um, I, I tell you, you will, you will really benefit if you take the initiative uh, and you form relationships with people who are older, godly, and wiser uh, so that you might make uh, a good decision. Well, I've shared with you uh, four principles so far about making a good decision. One is maintain a growing relationship with Christ. Number two is follow the Bible. Number three is get more information. Number four is get wisdom from godly people. But there's a fifth principle that I want to share with you. So we have seven total, right? So our number five. And the fifth principle would be evaluate the options. Evaluate the options. Sometimes you are faced with a decision and you have multiple, um, multiple options from which to choose, uh, more than one. Uh, what summer job will I pursue? What college will I attend? What career should I pursue? How will I spend my Saturdays? So sometimes you are faced with a decision and there are multiple options from which you can choose. Now, when you face a decision with multiple options, it's important uh, that you ask 
um, a number of questions about uh, the decisions that you face. And you're going to see that I'm going to give you in just a moment many, many questions that you can ask when you're faced with a decision with multiple options. What I want you to understand is that I don't ask these questions every time I have to make a decision. And I would not encourage you as well, uh, you, else you would never make a decision, right? I mean, some of the questions that I'll ask in a moment, they won't apply to every single situation. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do for you is I'm trying to give you some questions that you can use if you need them, right? Uh, so think of the questions that I give you in a moment as like clothes in a clothes closet. So if you walk into your clothes closet, you, you probably have many, many clothes in the closet. Are you going to put on every single uh, piece of clothing in your closet and walk out of the house today? No, you're not, right? Uh, you're going to pick you know, some pants, you're gonna pick a shirt, uh, you're gonna get some socks, you're gonna get some other things and you're just gonna wear one outfit. Uh, and so it, it's similar to uh, the questions that I give you. I'm going to give you all kinds of clothes to choose from. And then you, you know, following God's leadership, following the Spirit's leadership, you'll choose which questions you might apply to a given situation. Uh, we can also think uh, maybe of like a library. You know, when you walk into a library, you, there are like thousands and thousands of books, and you don't check out every single book in the library. You just check out the ones that you need for a given situation. Okay, so let's look at some of these questions that you and I might uh, consult or might rely upon. And again, we're facing a decision, and this decision is one in which we have multiple options. What job do I take? What college do I attend? <clears throat> so here's some things that you might want to ask yourself uh, in order to be a wise uh, leader and make a wise decision. What are the pros and cons? So you take, say, the two most, the two best options, and you list the pros and cons for both. Okay, this is just common sense, but you, you write down the pros, you write down the cons, uh, and you use the wisdom that God gives you, use the brain that God gave you. Uh, what are the risks tied to each option? So I would ask myself if I had two options from which to choose. If I choose option A, what is the worst thing that can happen? If I choose option B, what is the worst thing that can happen? And, you know, if you, um, if, it, if it could harm someone, uh, if it could have extremely negative consequences, uh, I'm obviously not going to choose that one that has the greater risk. Um, what might you lose? Okay, and this is similar to uh, the last question, but I, I, include, I include it as a separate one because you know, there are risks and sometimes risks include what you lose. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what are you going to lose if you follow option A? What could you lose potentially uh, maybe a friendship, maybe a relationship, maybe the respect of people. It's important that you keep this in mind, maybe money. What could you gain if you choose a given option? So don't think just in negative terms, right? Think in positive terms. I mean, sometimes we take well thought out, calculated, uh, informed and well-researched risk for what we can gain. And, and, you know, maybe you might say, well, I've got two options for college and uh, one is more expensive. Um, and yet I know with this more expensive degree, it might open up more doors um, for a job. And so that would be a, a, maybe a research, a calculated risk that you could take that might lead to new opportunities. What will happen in regard to your Christian witness? So if you choose one option, how will it affect your witness? Okay, will it harm your witness? Will it hurt your witness? We don't want to choose any option that causes us to disobey Christ. What will it do to your reputation? Um, again, we're not, we're not all about ourselves or just focus on, you know, what people think of us, but we have a reputation. You know, each of us have a reputation. We want to be wise and make a decision that doesn't harm that reputation. Ultimately, it's the, it's the witness of Christ that we're concerned about. What will be the result for others? So if you choose one given option, what will be the result? Um, what will be the result for your friends, for your parents, for your brother, for your sister? What will be the result for your future spouse or your children? You, you might not think about this, but the decisions and choices that you make now will affect your future spouse, your children, even your grandchildren. Um, it's important to keep that in mind. I mean, sometimes one decision that we make today uh, is a decision that has consequences for generations. Say if people take a certain job, in a different state, or if people um, 
you know, choose a certain career path or if they choose to become an alcoholic or something. I mean, the choices that we make today uh, will affect our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, and uh, potentially many, many others. Um, what resources are needed? So let's say that I want to, um, I, I don't know, I want to, you know, build a house or something, or I, I want to pursue a degree or something. I mean, what resources do I need to do these things? I mean, I think it's, it's wise that you first ask yourself the resources that you might need for a given path. Uh, what does probability suggest? What does probability suggest? Now, I'm going to camp out here for just a moment and talk about probability. You say, Dr. Brown, I've, I've never heard of probability before. Well, um, that's okay. You're going you're gonna to know something about it <laughs> in just a moment. What, how do we define the word probability? Okay, For our purposes here, I want to define it very simply. Probability would refer to the most likely result uh, by choosing a certain option. So probability, it is the most likely result uh, after choosing a given option. And so we can think about um, we can think about this. Um, what happens if I choose option A, right? If I choose option A, I would ask these questions. What is the most likely result uh, when it comes to similar situations? Okay. Um, based on similar situations, what is the most likely result based on what I know has happened in similar situations? What has happened nine times, nine times out of 10 in similar situations? What does common sense tell me? Uh, what do typical patterns of human behavior tell me? Okay, so if I choose one option, um, from what I know typically happens in the past, how people respond, there's a good chance that that same result will occur uh, in, in my situation. And one example I'll give you, is, it's extreme, but I think you'll remember it. Uh, let's just say that you make the decision to run red lights. So you've decided, um, you know, whenever you see a red light, you're not going to stop. I don't care how bad the traffic is. I don't care what time of day it is. You're just going to keep running every red light because you're just not going to wait. Okay. Now, what, what will eventually happen? What do you think will eventually happen? Well, you, you know what typically happens when people run red lights. There's a crash. They die. Other people die. I mean, your, their vehicle is damaged. Uh, they might make it through one time with no injuries and with no other cars there. They might make it through a second time. But at some point, common sense tells you, similar situations tell you, uh, typical patterns <laughs> of, of the past tell you that when you run red light, a red light, uh, you're going to be killed or someone around you is going to be killed. Okay, and so when I talk about probability, that's what I'm talking about. Um, it is, uh, you know, it is what, what typically happens what typically happens in the past that we think will happen in the future, you know, based on um, typical patterns of behavior. So why do I mention this? Why do I talk about probability? In fact, I've spent more time on probability than the other uh, questions that I uh, gave you. I think it's important that when you make a decision that you base your decision on wisdom, um, common sense, um, what typically happens, a lot of times we base our decisions on wishful thinking, or we base our decisions on what we hope will happen, or we base our decisions based on unrealistic fantasy. And sometimes you and I just need a strong dose of reality. Okay, I'm not trying to you know, squelch your dreams. I'm not trying to decrease your faith. I'm not trying to say any way that God can't do anything. God can do anything. You and I should have faith. You and I should think big, right? But I also know that uh, there are occasions when we should really think hard and we should really think long about how people typically respond in a given situation, uh, what usually happens, and then uh, make that decision based on probability, okay? It's not always easy, not always pleasant, but I, I think it's important that we, uh, we do that. Uh, common sense uh, is something that more of us could apply uh, more often. So uh, we've looked at a number of um, principles for making good decisions. Let me share with you a sixth principle here. We've got this one and one more. We're almost finished. Uh, consider the decision in light of other goals. Consider your decision in light of other goals. So sometimes when you are making a decision, uh, essentially you are wanting to pursue a certain path. 
or you have a goal that you want to accomplish. And so you have a decision to make. What is wise for you and me to do is to take the goal that we have that, that is within that decision that we want to make and to place it beside other goals uh, to uh, prioritize them and see what is most important. So what I mean by this is um, rarely will one pursuit or one goal or one decision that you and I make be in a vacuum or be by itself. And so all I'm asking you to do is just to take your decision that you're making and put it within the framework of other things that you may feel God wants you to accomplish, other goals, other things that are important to you. So let me give you some example. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say that your goal, <coughs> your goal is to visit a friend in Texas. So it is your desire, um, you know, to, to visit a friend in Texas this summer. Uh, you want to go in July and uh, you're just, you really like this friend. And, you know, you live here in South Carolina. You're excited to go see them. You haven't seen them in a while. Now to go to Texas and visit your friend, it's going to cost money. It's going to cost probably about $500 um, and some change for airfare, for, um, you know, for food as you're there. So um, you're going to have to spend some money in order to go. Now you also have some other goals. And what are your other goals? Well, um, you have to repay your brother some money that you owe him. And so you borrowed money earlier in the year. Uh, you wanted to buy some shoes and jacket. And so you borrowed money from your brother. You borrowed, uh, let's say, $100. And you need to, need to repay your brother. That's a goal that you have. Another goal that you have is to repair your car's brakes. Your car is probably going to be okay for a few more months. But by the fall, um, you're really going to need to have those brakes repaired or they won't be safe. And so you're faced with three goals, right? Visiting a friend in Texas, uh, repaying your brother money that you borrowed, and then repairing your car's brakes. And so what I would do is I would encourage you to take uh, your goals or to take the question that you're facing uh, and to rank your goals, okay? And what I've done here is um, I've told you what I, the way that I would rank these decisions. So I put repaying money to my brother as number one. Um, I put repairing my car's brakes, number two. And I put visiting a friend in Texas as number three. And uh, one, one little piece of the puzzle that I left out, I'm sorry. Um, all you have in savings is $525. Okay, so your parents, they're trying to teach you the value of a dollar. They're not going to give you any more money. And uh, all you have to spend is $525. And so you can't do everything. You can't accomplish every goal in the next six months, but you can do a few of them. So I put repaying money to my brother first because I think um, you know, people of integrity repay their debts. I put repairing my car's brakes, which is $400, second because I know they're only going to last so long. And I put visiting my friend in Texas, uh, number three, because if I do these things, if I repay my brother and if I repair the brakes in my car, I've only got $525 in savings and I, I just don't have enough. Okay. Now, uh, this is how I made this decision. Uh, this is how I rank these based on certain principles. Uh, number one, essentially integrity. Number two, safety. Number three, um, you know, just friendship or pleasure or entertainment or enjoyment. Uh, now, what if your friend in Texas was dying of cancer? Well, that might change things, right? Um, and so I'm not saying that one is necessarily you know, bad or, 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 or terrible uh, if you rearrange them, but my point is when you are faced with a decision that you have to make, um, it is wise that you put that decision uh, within the framework of other goals or dreams or responsibilities that you have uh, in that you rank them and that you, you essentially, you know, do the right thing, you know, follow biblical principles uh, in order to make uh, decisions as far as what to do. So uh, we've mentioned um, six principles already, um, many, many principles, but I want to focus on one final principle, and that is engage in personal reflection. Engage in personal reflection. Okay, this is where we look internally and we're very honest with ourselves and we ask probing questions uh, and we reflect on the decision that we need to make and we take some time to do that. 
Okay, so just like um, principle number five, where I, I told, I gave you a series of questions when it came to various um, uh, options, you know, when you have two or three options or something, I gave you many, many questions. With this principle, engage in personal reflection, I'm going to give you many, many questions to ask. But as I shared before, I don't ask all of these questions every time I'm faced with a decision, okay? I, I review them maybe periodically. I'm aware of them. They're, they're in me. And I just apply whatever questions I need for a given situation. And so, you know, again, it's like the clothes in your closet. You're not going to wear all your clothes at one time, but you, you are going to wear, you know, one suit at least go, or one uh, group of clothing as you go out. And it's the same way with these questions. So uh, first question that I would ask myself is uh, what biblical principles should inform my decision? What biblical principles should inform my decision? So we just basically go back to principle number one. I'm always asking you to think about that again and again. Um, am I making a decision in isolation or by myself? And what I want to caution you against is making major decisions by yourself in isolation. Uh, it is, it is, it can be very dangerous sometimes when we don't consult others, when we just uh, secretly or privately try to make a decision and not share it with others. I tell you, sometimes, I mean, I can, I can have a very good attitude. I can think very logically, but sometimes when I'm just by myself, I mean, I can just begin to rationalize or I can begin to, you know, worry about things that aren't something you should worry about. And Sometimes when you isolate yourself from other people, you really can make some foolish decisions. And so I would encourage you not to isolate yourself, especially when it comes to major decisions. Bring other people into the conversation. Am I hiding my decision? I think this is a question that you should ask as well as you engage in uh, internal reflection. Usually when we hide a decision, it usually means that uh, we shouldn't go in a certain direction. So if I'm, if I'm hiding, uh, something that I'm trying to do or something that I want to accomplish. Maybe I have a relationship. I want to have a relationship with somebody and I don't want anybody to know about. Maybe I want to make a purchase and I don't want people to know about it. Maybe I just want to do something and I want to hide my decision. That's a red flag. And it may be an indication that you probably shouldn't do that thing that you want to do. Okay. So just as a general principle, if you want to be a wise person, if you want to make a good decision, um, I think it's a red flag when you try to hide what you're doing from others, when you don't want anyone to, um, to find out. Uh, would I be embarrassed if others knew the choice that I am considering? And so maybe there's a decision that you're trying to make in private and uh, you're, you're, you would really like to keep that to yourself. Uh, well, the reality is very few decisions that we make in private remain private. Typically, I found in my life that um, things that I decide privately eventually become public. And so if you're going to be embarrassed, if others find out about the decision that you made, you better think long and hard about the decision because nine times out of 10, they will find out about it. Another question that we need to ask when facing a decision is, uh, what is my response when others challenge me or question me? So let's say that you're faced with a decision and you say, I want to follow option A. And you share that with a friend. You say, I want to go in this direction. I want to choose this option. And your friend critiques you or your friend questions you or your friend challenges you. So what is your response? Now, if your response is anger or you snap back at your friend, to me, that's a red flag. Um, to me, a person is not a wise person. A person doesn't typically make good decisions when they respond in anger or they snap at someone. I mean, a wise person is willing to listen, willing to have their ideas critiqued, um, willing to, to hear the voice of others. And so, you know, if your response when someone challenges um, a decision that you want to make is, is really harsh, um, think through what you are um, uh, considering doing and maybe pause because it may not be the best decision. Are you trying to make a decision when you are exhausted or you are stressed? I do not encourage you to make major decisions when you are exhausted, when you are stressed, um, you know, when you haven't had a good night's sleep, when you haven't had time to think about it. Um, I, I just don't think making decisions under pressure is a, is a good thing when you're tired or exhausted. Um, 
am I being inappropriately influenced by others? This is another, I think, good question uh, to use, uh, to apply to yourself. For example, maybe there's a strong personality who is pressuring you to make a decision one way or the other. There's a charismatic individual who is pressuring you. There's an authority figure or even there's peer pressure. At the end of the day, you need to make a decision where you are not pressured by others to make that decision. Um, you, um, you certainly don't want like a car salesman to pressure you, or you don't want a boyfriend or a girlfriend to pressure you, or you don't want a friend who may even um, have, have good intentions, but who may just, you know, be just too assertive and too aggressive as far as what you should do. Um, am I being pressured to make a quick financial decision? Um, years ago, uh, when I was a student in college, uh, a friend of mine, uh, his dad came to visit, um, and uh, he made he made an offhanded comment, and I've never forgotten. It's funny how he just made an offhanded comment, and it's remained with me to this day. But we were we were buying something, or he was purchasing something. He turned to me and he said, "I never make quick financial decisions when it deals with large amounts of money. I never make quick." financial decisions when it deals with large amounts of money. And so what he meant was if I'm buying a car or I'm buying a house or I'm buying something very expensive, I never let people pressure me to make a quick financial decision. He just walks away uh, if, if pressure is applied to spend a lot of money in a short amount of time. And I've tried to follow that principle throughout my life. Uh, most times I have, and it, it has really served me well. Uh, and so I would say to you, if someone is pressuring you to make a financial decision or really any like any kind of major decision, you know, if it's marriage or relationship um, or buying a house or whatever, um, I don't feel like you should be pressured to make quick decisions uh, when it comes to big things. I think you should have, you know, someone who cares about you, someone who respects you they're going to allow you to pause and to maybe pray about it, think about it, take a week or so, and then come back. I think it says a lot about the person and um, when they refuse to give you time to think things through. It just shows, you know, the lack of respect. It might show they're trying to take advantage of you. They want you to make a quick decision so they can get what they want. And so be wise because people will do that. Um, have you considered your abilities, your inclinations, or uh, what you enjoy doing. This relates to, uh, say, a job. So let's say that you are faced with several job possibilities. I would ask myself, um, what are my abilities? What are my strengths and weaknesses? What are my inclinations? What do I enjoy doing? And so if it's a job, especially a job, if it's an activity, uh, you definitely want to think about your strengths and weaknesses. You don't want to take a job that you're not good at. You don't want to take a job that you don't enjoy. Uh, you don't want to take a job that's just not your passion. You ultimately want to pursue a job that uh, is, you know, it's just, it meets you in your sweet spot. It's what you're passionate about. Now, in reality, we all have to, we all have to do jobs sometimes for a season that we don't like. You know, in high school, I worked in fast food. Um, I've done construction work. I've done a lot of things, you know, uh, mowed lawns and things to make money. I mean, you, you may not necessarily you know, want to work in fast food the rest of your life. Okay, maybe you will, maybe you won't, but um, it's because it's a very hard job. But you you will want to definitely ask yourself if you're thinking about a job or some some kind of career. Uh, am I really good at this? Do I really enjoy this? Uh, so it's something to something to keep in mind. Another question that I would ask is um, my motives. What about my motives? Am I making a decision from good motives, or do I have impure motives? Uh, so what are your motives when you are going in one direction, when you're choosing one option, what are your motives? And if your motives are not biblical, if your motives are not Christ honoring, if your motives are just based on selfishness or pleasing, you know, pleasing yourself, then I definitely wouldn't go in, in a certain direction. Other questions would be, what is the impact on others? And we've talked about this before. Uh, emotional decision. Am I making an emotional decision? Um, I, I think that um, nothing wrong with emotions. God gives us emotions. Emotions are how we express who we are, but you need to be, be wise and make sure that you're just not uh, so emotional or so distressed that you, you make a decision that you regret later on. 
Um, you know, our, sometimes emotions can get the best of us. They can so control us that we make decisions, we say things, we agree to do things, we, we you know, tell people off in anger or something, and we really regret that later on. And so don't make decisions when you are uh, emotionally distressed or when your emotions control you. Um, a relationship with someone who doesn't honor Christ or uh, biblical principles. And so here, what I have in mind is I would discourage you from entering into a relationship with someone who doesn't honor Christ or who doesn't follow biblical principles. And that might be an employer. That might be like a best friendship. That might be, it certainly would be a marriage or a relationship. Now, you know, as a believer, you interact with non-Christians all the time, right? But there are some relationships like these very, very close and intimate relationships like marriage or uh, like working, you know, working for a boss or something, you want to be careful that you're not uh, entering into a relationship where someone is going to push you or um, tempt you or encourage you to dishonor Christ. And then I think another question that we ask would be, uh, what do I value in life? So uh, what I mean by this is, will pursuing one alternative cause you to lose what you value? So if you choose option A, would it cause you to lose a relationship? Would it cause you to lose, you know, the respect of people? Uh, would it jeopardize something? And so my encouragement to you is, is don't risk precious things that uh, you value a great deal. <clears throat> if, if you're going to lose something very valuable and very dear to you, uh, don't choose a certain option because uh, you very well could lose that thing that you value. Uh, also, uh, does, does this decision contribute to the kind of person that I want to be? I mean, most people want to be an ethical person. Most people want to be healthy. Uh, most people want to be like in a better spot 10 years from now, financially, spiritually, health-wise, than they are now. And so will pursuing one given option result in you not being uh, spiritually healthy, physically healthy? Uh, financially <clears throat> sound. You know, if you make the decision to use drugs, if you make the decision to enter into a relationship with a dishonest person, if you, you know, you, if you make decisions now uh, and, and they send you a certain direction that in that direction doesn't contribute to the kind of person that you know you want to be in the future, don't pursue that path. We are, in actuality, uh, the, the total sum of many, many small decisions that we make um, throughout the course of our life. And I can tell you that in general, um, show me the decisions that you're making now and I can tell you where you will probably be five or 10 years from now. And so what I mean by this is when you make decisions, make sure that they contribute to the kind of person that you want to be, the kind of person that God wants you to be, all right? Um, so keep that in mind uh, because I think that's, that's very important that you and I do that. Um, don't pursue an opportunity just because it's there. Okay, so ask yourself, am I just pursuing this opportunity because the door is open? Sometimes God opens the door and you he means he, he puts that door before you because he wants you to go through that door. But sometimes there's an open door and that doesn't necessarily mean that you should follow it. Okay, so I don't, I don't buy the idea. I don't affirm the idea that just because there's an open door just because there's an opportunity that you should go through it. I think you should do some personal reflection. Do you have the Holy Spirit's peace? And if you're a believer, um, do, you, do you sense that the Holy Spirit is, is granting you his peace, um, um, his presence in this decision? Uh, do, you just, do you just feel like he is in this? Um, and if he is not, if you just feel very uncomfortable about this, you don't have his peace, it might be wise for you to back off. Uh, do you recognize that you have God's freedom? Okay, a lot of times people will um, feel as though they have to find God's will. They have to like reach and discover that dot on the page. And if they, if they miss that dot, if they just don't pray hard enough, if they just don't listen to enough people, if they just don't read their Bible enough, they're going to miss God's will and he's going to be angry at them. The reality of the matter is, uh, provided that you are following scripture, you are honoring the Lord, you are following his will. God gives you freedom uh, to make decisions, you know, freedom in regard to who to marry, freedom in regard to a career. And uh, I, I think there are some Christians who are very sensitive in their conscience and they, uh, 
they just feel like if they miss God's will, he's going to punish them. And that's not true. I mean, God gives believers a great deal of free, freedom uh, to make uh, decisions. And then finally, um, am I avoiding what I know is right? In some situations, you and I know exactly what we should do. Break up with that boyfriend. Um, leave this job. Take this job. Um, you know, repay a debt. Um, share the gospel with somebody. We, we know what we should do, and yet just we don't want to do it because it makes us uncomfortable. It's, it's, it's not something that we uh, would enjoy doing. And, and I would say here in these kind of situations, you and I need to engage in some personal reflection and, and just do what we know God wants us to do. Don't avoid doing what we know is right. Okay, so if you're not doing something or you're not going in a certain direction, uh, just because you're avoiding what you know God wants you to do, um, do what God wants you to do. All right. Um, so let me say a few things uh, in conclusion. So I've given you uh, seven principles here, and I list the principles again. Maintain a growing relationship with Christ. Follow the Bible. Get more information. Get wisdom from godly people. Evaluate the options. Consider the decision in light of other goals and then engage in personal reflection. Now, for me personally, I always, I'm always following principles one and two. For every decision that I'm following, for most decisions, for every decision rather, I'm always striving to maintain a growing relationship with Christ. I'm always following the Bible. But for decisions three through seven, um, you know, they may be like small decisions. They may not, they may not require a lot more information or you know, for me to consult other people or to, you know, take a chart and write out the various options or so forth. Uh, but I always keep principles one and two with me, and I would encourage you to keep principles one and two with you. And then as God's spirit leads, uh, you know, common sense, wisdom, you apply principles three through seven, uh, certainly uh, as, um, as you should. So let me close by uh, saying this. Um, I think these are great principles, uh, principles that I've gleaned from others who are much wiser than me. But I, I want to make clear that um, when it comes to making good decisions, I, I'm not suggesting that if you follow these decisions, if you follow, excuse me, if you follow these principles, uh, that you will always make the best decision or a perfect decision. And why do I say that? Because in reality, uh, you and I are human we're fallible. Our judgments can sometimes be clouded. And so in sharing these principles, I'm not suggesting necessarily that you're always going to make the perfect decision. You know, life is life, and this is a fallen world, and we're fallen people. We're fallen creatures. And, um, but all you can do is just use these principles to make the very best decision possible. Uh, I'm also, in sharing these principles, I'm not suggesting that things will always go uh, as you planned. Uh, exactly as you plan. Uh, you can control your decisions, right? And I can control my decisions, but we cannot control the outcome, especially when other people are involved. Um, you can't control people and I can't control people. And so it's important, I think, that we, while we appreciate these principles and we, we, we use these principles, we recognize that um, you know, ultimately, um, we're not able to control everything, and we're not able always to have things go exactly our way. But in saying that, um, let me encourage you uh, by saying that the Lord is sovereign. Uh, the Lord is, is in control regardless of the outcome, uh, and he's there for you, and uh, he's there to give you wisdom before the decision. He's there to help you even after the decision. Even if things don't go quite the way that you hoped they would go, Remember that God is sovereign over all things, and it's not up to us ultimately as far as um, how smart we are or how wise we are or how well we apply these principles. Ultimately, it's, it's just following God's word. It's doing what honors him and just leaving the results to God.